All right, hello and welcome everyone. My name is Megan Weber. I am an extension educator here at the University of Minnesota focusing on aquatic invasive species. And I'm happy that you chose to join us today for the next of our aquatic invasive species webinar series. Um, we're about to get that started. I have a couple of housekeeping items that I'll go over and then I'm going to pass the screen share and microphone over to Angelique and Diane to give their presentation. So um, first, you might notice that there's a transcript appearing at the bottom of your screen. Um, we have the live transcript turned on. If you would rather not see that, you should see a button um, down towards the bottom. You might have to wiggle your mouse to make it pop up, um, but you should see something that says live transcript, and you can shut that off there. Uh, we are recording today's webinar, so if you would like to view it at a later date, uh, we will get that closed captioned and have that up on our YouTube channel. I'll make sure to share the address to the channel at the end. We'll have that up on the screen. Um, finally, if you have any questions during the webinar, uh, please enter those into the chat box. Um, on the screen now, you should see what you, what you might be seeing at the bottom of your screen um, with the chat circled. So just go ahead and type your question in there. You can type your questions in at any point during the webinar and uh, we'll be saving those and recording them coming and revisiting those once we hit the Q&A session um, after Angelique and Diane are done speaking. Um, if you do run into any technical issues during the webinar, you can either ask us questions in the chat, we'll be monitoring it there. Um, uh, if you're having troubles within Zoom, feel free to send an email to Pat as well. His email is showing on the screen and he will be monitoring that uh, throughout the webinar. So he'll be able to help you troubleshoot any issues there. So with that, um, I'm going to turn this over to Angelique and Diane to give their talk uh, about their work using low doses of copper on Lake Minnetonka for zebra mussel suppression. And I'll allow the two of them to go ahead and introduce themselves. So I'll pass it on over to you guys. Well, thank you, Megan. I, and thanks to all the participants for listening in today. I'm Diane Waller. I'm a research fishery biologist at the USGS Upper Midwest Environmental Science Center in La Crosse, Wisconsin. And my research focuses on freshwater mussels. So both control of invasive mussels and conservation of um, our imperiled native mussels. So I'm co-presenting today with Angelique Dalberg. Angelique. Hi, I'm Angelique Dalberg, and I am currently a grad student in the Conservation Sciences Program at the University of Minnesota, working on my PhD with um, a focus on zebra mussel suppression. Okay, well, thank you so much again for the invitation to present this collaborative research that is um, going on between USGS and the Minnesota Aquatic Invasive Species Research Center to look at low-dose copper for zebra mussel management. I was involved in the early planning stages of this work in 2017 and 18, but Jim Loma was the project manager until just early last year and really has spearheaded this study. Uh, Jim and his crew, with Angelique's assistance, executed the treatment and the uh, um, sampling that was done last year, and I've taken over long-term monitoring of the project in the next phase of the work. Next. Next slide. Okay, thanks. Funding um, for the project came from the Minnesota Environment and Natural Resources Trust Fund and the Minnesota Aquatic Invasive Species Research Center, along with Hennepin County, Pelican Lakes Association, Fletcher Family Foundation and others shown here. Uh, Tonka Bay Marina provided really invaluable support for technical operations uh, during the treatment. And a project of this size just isn't possible if you don't have support. And we had a lot from local and state partners, um, some of which are shown here. Next. So I'm going to start with a brief overview of copper use in lake management and then describe the project objectives and study design. And then Angelique will take over to present the results from the 2019 treatment and our plans for future research. This presentation is not an endorsement of Earth Tech products. Next slide. So as you know, copper has a long history of use in aquatic systems. 
Copper plating was and is still used to prevent biofouling by organisms that attach, including zebra mussels. But it's also been used to control algae, nuisance vegetation, and snails, among other things. In Minnesota, zebra mussel eradication efforts, um, some of these rapid response efforts, have used some form of copper in a number of lakes between 2011 and 2019 which you see on the table here. Some of these also included the use of other toxicants with the copper, like potash and sequinox. Most of them used a formulation of copper known as Earth Tech QZ. And this is the product that we're also evaluating. These treatments were intended to kill all life stages of the muscles and used up to uh, one milligram per liter of copper, which is the maximum allowed on the label. And all of these were enclosed partial lake treatments. Earth Tech has also, uh, was also used in an eradication effort in Nebraska on Office Air Force Base. Uh, these, the results from that treatment were a little mixed. It did kill mussels, but it also caused some significant fish mortality. Uh, there was a treatment, uh, in a 12 hectare lake in Pennsylvania in 2017 with Earth Tech that uh, reportedly eradicated all mussels from the quarry. They applied the Earth Tech three times over 37 days at about half of the maximum label. So the concentration was around 0.04 milligrams per liter. And time will tell really whether this was a complete eradication um, in some long-term monitoring on that quarry. Next. So a copper concentration of one milligram per liter is toxic to adult mussels. The early stages, especially the veliger or the larval stage, should be sensitive to lower concentration. We, we assume that those early life stages are more sensitive than the adult. And in 2016, Mike McCartney at the University of Minnesota conducted some trials with copper in enclosures and compared the sensitivity of adults and villagers. And he found that the lethal concentrations to kill 50% of the villagers or the LC50 was 64 times lower than the adult LC50. In another study, Renata Claudi reported an LC50 for villagers of about 19 micrograms of parts per billion as copper, which is about 53 times lower than that um, reported for adults. Next. So Earth Tech QZ is registered for open water use as a molluscicide, and from efforts in Minnesota lakes, um, it has been shown to work. The research by McCartney and Claudie showed that lower copper doses can kill villagers. So what more do we need to know? Well, we also know that copper is toxic to non-target species. So before copper is used in a dreisinid management program, more data are needed to determine how we might minimize ecological and economic costs and maximize the long-term benefits to a water body when copper is used. So the objectives of this project were to evaluate the effectiveness of a low dose uh, treatment with copper for villager suppression and then juvenile settlement after the treatment. Secondly, to measure the response of non-target organisms to the treatment. And lastly, to see if reducing recruitment one year would translate to decreased zebra mussel density the next year and a benefit to native communities. Next slide. A little bit of information about Earth Tech QZ. Um, it is certified for use in potable water supplies. It's a liquid formulation, acid stabilized in an ionic form of the copper. There's no uh, post application reentry or water use restrictions. And as I mentioned, the label allows treatment up to one milligram per liter of copper. The target concentration in this study was about 6% of that. The application was scheduled to uh, around peak villager abundance, which occurs around mid-July in Minnesota. 
The product was applied only to the epilimnium, so that was about the upper five to six meters of the water column. So before each application, the thermocline was measured and the volume of water above it was estimated. The treatment was applied every other day for 10 days, beginning on July 22nd through the 30th. And in addition to measuring zebra mussel responses, we assessed impact to four fish species, a native mussel, zooplankton, and benthic invertebrates, and water quality parameters. Next slide. The study was conducted on Lake Minnetonka in the Twin Cities area, and zebra mussels were first found in this lake in 2010, and they're well established in different areas across the lake. Um, this is not the first zebra mussel study that we've conducted in Lake Minnetonka. When control and treatment sites were established, you know, it's important that the bays were isolated so there was no uh, mixing of the treatment into the control area, but also that they were similar in their water quality and, and zebra mussel density and other features um, as much as possible. There were some differences in size and symmetry, as you can see here. The control site in Robinson Bay um, is about 37 hectares with a maximum depth, depth of 19 meters and has more of a sand to gravel substrate. Whereas the treatment site in St. Albans is shallower and has about 40% more surface area. And the substrate here is more of a organic rich uh, silt material. Next slide. Five locations were identified as sampling sites spread throughout each bay and then marked with the buoy. Our test animals were held and plankton toes, benthic grabs, and water samples were then collected near these buoys before, during, and after the treatment. Next slide. So here's a graph that uh, shows the copper concentration over the 10 day treatment period. The dashed blue line is the target concentration of 60 um, micrograms per liter. The star was the initial application which we targeted at 100, um, just a higher concentration because we expected it to fall. And then the crosses are the bump treatments that were applied on alternate days to maintain the concentration above the target. The dash black line is our copper measurements that were made in the field each day with the Hawk meter. And these were used to determine how much to apply on those bump treatment days. The solid black line are the samples that were analyzed by ICP in, uh, back in our laboratory. So you can see the ICP uh, analysis was about 15 uh, micrograms higher than the field measurements. But overall, the concentration was maintained above that target level. Um, it's not shown on this graph, but within two weeks after the treatment, copper concentration had decreased 50%. And it was back to background between 60 to 90 days after the treatment. And now I'll turn it over to Angelique to uh, talk about the results. Thanks, Diane. All right, um, this is Angelique, and I will take it from here. So uh, to understand how this treatment impacted zebra mussels, which were our target organism, we monitored the villager densities before and after treatment in both bays, juvenile presence on settlement plates in both bays, presence of living adults in the resident population of the lake in both bays. And our preliminary analyses of our data indicate that the treatments effectively reduce zebra mussel villager density. Pre-treatment villager density in both bays was similar and even slightly higher in our test bay, um, which you can see on this figure under the pre-treatment columns. And after 14 days, the density was around the same level in that control bay, but the villagers were nearly absent in the test bay. Additionally, the treatment effectively reduced zebra mussel settlement. We placed settlement plates in both bays. We retrieved half of those at 
30 days after treatment conclusion and retrieve the other half at 90 days after treatment. And at both time periods, we saw very few attached muscles in the test bay, while the numbers in the control bay were more than three orders of magnitude higher. And this indicates strong treatment-related density reductions. Finally, so I mentioned those three aspects of zebra mussels that we looked at. We also observed a decrease in adult resident zebra mussels in the treated bay. To assess this, we had a scuba diver run transects in both bays in early July before the treatment, and then in September, nearly two months after the treatment. The scuba diver enumerated the living resident adults in quadrats along transects, and um, here we have the results in two figures. These are the same data that we're looking at, just displayed a little differently. So the figure on the left part of the screen, we're just looking at live zebra mussels. That's the density of zebra mussels per meter squared, both before the treatment and after the treatment. The figure on the right, we're looking at the percentage of zebra mussels that are alive. So that takes into account the um, zebra mussels that were found that were not living. So prior to treatment, we saw similar densities in living adult mussels. After treatment, we continued to see high numbers of living adults in the control bay. However, density and percent alive both declined by two orders of magnitude in the treated bay. And I'll mention now that a later slide will show that the survival of caged adult zebra mussels held near the sampling buoys was also reduced in the treated bay. And that is coming up. So in addition to the impacts to zebra mussel settlement, we also looked at a variety of non-target impacts. First among those, we monitored some water quality and chemistry metrics. We observed a slight depression in dissolved oxygen concentrations in the treated bay after exposure. Um, however, those levels did not drop to a point where they would cause harm to aquatic life. Other water parameters remain similar throughout the study period. Um, we've just chosen to display and list some of those here. And I will mention um, that all water quality constituents required for the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency's biotic ligand model were collected and can be used to determine comparable copper concentrations in waters with different chemistry profiles. And I'll talk a little bit more about this later in the presentation. We found some impacts to algal productivity as measured by chlorophyll A and secchi disk readings. Chlorophyll A samples and secchi disk depth measurements were collected and measured one day prior to initial treatment, one day after the first day of treatment, and 14 days after treatment concluded. In the treated bay, both chlorophyll A concentrations and secchi disc depth indicated a substantial treatment-related increase in phytoplankton immediately after treatment, followed by decreases seen 14 days or on this figure two weeks after treatment. Um, meanwhile, the control bay had an increasing trend in chlorophyll A concentrations and a decreasing trend in secchi disc depth over the sampling time, indicating a steadily increasing phytoplankton community. We found a decrease in the abundance of both benthic invertebrates and zooplankton. Um, here we have the benthic invertebrate data on the left and the zooplankton data on the right. Again, um, we took some measurements pre-treatment, one day after treatment began, and then two weeks after treatment concluded. For the benthic invertebrates, we um, used ponar grab samples, and in the control bay, abundance increased at each sampling point. In the treated bay, the opposite occurred, and there was no detectable difference between those sample periods in each bay. So we did see a difference between the bays, but not um, within the time periods. 
we uh, enumerated the zooplankton using plankton toes and in the control bay the zooplankton density was greater 14 days after treatment compared to pre and one day after treatment um, there was a considerable reduction in the density of native zooplankton in the treated bay immediately after treatment and then at the start after two weeks after at the start of recovery. So um, we see for the, the control bay, it does that increase and for the test bay, um, each of those bars, I'll try to mouse over them, is significantly different from the other two bars. And we are doing community composition analysis on these numbers as well. In addition to uh, those organisms we monitored that were already living in the lake, we also monitored caged fish, native mussels, and adult zebra mussels. We placed fat mucket mussels, fat head minnows, bluegills, largemouth bass, yellow perch, and adult zebra mussels in independent cages beneath each buoy in both bays. The cages went in the day before treatment and were retrieved the day after treatment concluded. Survival was calculated based on the number of stocked organisms and not the number recovered. So sample sizes were either four or five for those. We saw that um, yellow perch and largemouth bass had similarly poor survival in both bays, perhaps due to some holding and handling stress. Um, there was some stress associated with transport and there was some additional stress at the buoy locations due to the cages being in a relatively shallow depth in the water, some predator presence, um, general turbulence, presence of wake boats, other factors. We also had some challenges with the recovery of our fish. For example, some mortalities may have happened early on, the tissues may have degraded or been consumed by other individuals within the enclosures. And uh, that's one of the reasons that our survival was based on the number of stocked organisms and not the number of recovered because we were unable to determine why they were not recovered. So this limited our ability to accurately determine mortality without making some assumptions. The main takeaway, though, is that treatment-related mortality was most apparent for zebra mussels and fathead minnows. Um, and one thing to consider that I'll just point out here, the survival of adult zebra mussels was greater than 60%, but this was after removing the cages one day following treatment. Um, based on the scuba survey of the live resident zebra mussels in the bay, we suspect there was some delayed mortality that would not have been captured by this. Once those fish and mussels were taken out of the lake, we sent them to the lab to be analyzed um, for copper accumulation in their tissues. And as you can see from these data, um, I guess bear in mind the sample size is less than or equal to five for each of those buoys. Um, so we saw that the zebra mussels um, accumulated the most copper in the treated bay in their sock tissues with an average of around 41 micrograms per gram, followed by native mussels, which had an average of 26.4 micrograms of copper per gram. Fathead minnows in the treated bay also showed some copper concentrations um, that were an order of magnitude higher than those in the control bay and noticeably higher than the accumulations in the tissues of the other fish. So as a, a summary, treatments effectively reduce zebra mussel villager density, juveniles uh, zebra mussel recruitment and live zebra mussel density in quadrat samples. Our non-target impacts varied, but included um, 
relative zooplankton mean density reduction immediately after treatment, although there was some recovery at two weeks out, an increase in chlorophyll A concentration, and then um, potentially a sensitivity within fathead minnow to copper. Moving forward from this, we, um, we have some next steps we're looking at. We want to learn what the long-term responses of zebra mussels are and what the long-term responses of non-targets are to copper. And we're also curious if we can effectively apply less copper. So we're going to continue monitoring in Lake Minnetonka. We're doing that this summer and we'll be doing that next summer. And we would like to add a second lake to our study. For the second lake, we know that copper toxicity changes with water quality metrics, and we know that we can predict copper toxicity using the biotic ligand model, which is a model used by the US Environmental Protection Agency to determine copper toxicity levels. So if we collect water quality measurements from a lake, we want to know if we can accurately predict the amount of copper to use to suppress villagers in that lake that we took the measurements from. And this in turn should result in minimal or the lowest amount of non-target impacts if we can do that. So I mentioned the biotic ligand model earlier in the talk. Um, and now I'm gonna go into some additional detail on that. The model is a tool that can predict the bioavailability and toxicity of copper to aquatic organisms under site-specific conditions, and it's used by the EPA as an acceptable criteria derivation method. We know that water chemistry in lakes and rivers is variable, and um, we know that copper toxicity changes with water chemistry. So we can measure different water chemistry metrics and use this model to predict site and species specific toxicity, which can then inform and guide our copper concentration use. This model is based off of the idea that different cations compete with one another to bind on aquatic organisms' gills, and the model requires certain water chemistry and quality measurements, including temperature, pH, dissolved organic carbon, calcium, magnesium, sodium, potassium, alkalinity, chloride, and sulfate. So essentially how the model operates in a very broad overview, um, you collect those water quality and chemistry measurements, input them into the model, and the model provides a final acute value, a criterion maximum concentration value, and a criterion continuous concentration value. And for our purposes, we're especially interested in the criterion continuous concentration, which is an estimate of the highest concentration of a material, here copper, in the water column to which an aquatic community or organism can be exposed to indefinitely without an unacceptable effect. So for this work, what we want to know is if we can use the water chemistry of a given lake, the second lake we would be working with, to control um, an organism, zebra mussels, to a certain level. So if we know something about the mortality impacts to an organism under certain conditions, we should be able to extrapolate and predict similar mortality impacts to that same organism under different water chemistry conditions. So we can use information on mortality under known conditions and relate that to um, the water chemistry and quality in our lake to predict what level of copper we could use for similar mortality impacts. Um, and that, I guess, that language would be for zebra mussels, obviously, or if we're looking at protecting other species, um, we could also work to predict some of that. So this year, we're conducting a one-year post-treatment monitoring on Lake Minnetonka. 
Um, that includes settlement plates, scuba transects, Bellager toes, benthic invertebrate grabs, zooplankton toes, and chlorophyll A collections. We're also hoping to do some site selection for a lake for um, some testing in 2021 and then treatment in 2022. And at this point, um, some criteria that we're looking at for a site selection include the lake would have uh, ideally an established zebra mussel population for this work. It would be somewhere between 1,500 and 15,000 acres in size, mainly to allow for distance between the treatment and control sites. And uh, we would ideally have some knowledge of the lake ecology before and after zebra mussel introduction so that we could compare the impacts of our treatment to that prior information. And then also just um, more, again, for logistics, it'd be nice to have a lake with either two bays or two semi-enclosed sites for independence between the treatment and the control. So these are things that we're looking at um, for getting our second site in order, our second lake. Um, so with that, I think I'll wrap up the, the talk portion of this and maybe um, shoot this back over to Megan and we can answer some questions. I guess it helps if I unmute. Thanks so much, Angelique and Diane, and we appreciate you taking your time to share your work with us. I'm going to um, share my screen again so that you can see the instructions um, for the Q&A. We have already had um, some questions roll in through chat. So if you have questions for Diane and Angelique, feel free, feel free to drop those into the chat box and we'll, we'll start working our way through those. Um, and I'll just go ahead and get started with the first one. Um, and that was, there was someone wondering if there's a white paper available that they might be able to access uh, regarding your work. So the final report from this uh, initial work from 2019 um, has been submitted to MACERC and it should be available for public release soon. So that would be, I think, um, the place to look for it. Great. Thanks, Dan. Um, and could you give some additional information about how the application went in the field? Sure, I'm, I'm pulling up my notes here now. So the application was on a boat mounted delivery system and we, uh, water was pulled in through a venturi apparatus to mix the water with EarthTech QZ. And then it was applied about a quarter meter below the water surface uh, from a horizontal boom that was fitted with dropper hoses. I think there's actually a picture of it on one of the slides that shows it um, a little bit better. And then we use a global positioning system so similar to what's used in uh, farm fields to guide the, the navigation or the application of it and monitor boat speed and application rate during it. Thank you. Oh. So Megan, can I can I share my screen real quick to show that? Go back to that photo. Yes. Okay if I do that. Let me stop mine. There you go. You should be able to share yours again. Thank you. So this is. Whoops, wrong one. Um. Sorry about that. This is that final slide that I ended on, this is the um, barge that did the application, just for anyone who's a little more visual, this is what we look like out there. And this is the, the boom system that allowed us to apply it underwater. Thanks, Megan. All right, thank you. And I'm just gonna pull my questions back up. Um, 
So if you if you think about the copper treatments in comparison to other um, zero muscle control methods, um, what would you see as the advantages to the low dose copper treatment compared to some other available control tools? Po in, in particular, potash was called out in this question. Well, uh, I will just mention that potash is actually not registered a registered product when it has been applied, it's been, um, there, there's been waivers applied for its application. And I, you know, it can be inexpensive, but potash is also something that persists in the environment. And potassium is quite uh, toxic to native mussels and some other non-target species as well. So it, there's some concerns, some of the same concerns uh, with potash that, that some might have with copper. And we've been using copper um, for many, many purposes for over a century now. So we have um, quite a bit of information out there on some of its impacts to non-target organisms which is, I mean, it's not ideal that there are still non-target impacts, but um, it's useful to know what we should look for. And it also is very strategic that we can um, use this low dose and really target that villager life stage. So, you know, it's just a, one advantage. Great. Um, and could you talk a little bit about what the water flow was like in the study area, if it was, and if there, there wasn't a lot of um, exchange of water, how you think this might scale to something where there may be more flow? Yeah, um, so I think we showed a map early on in the presentation of the treatment bay, which was St. Albans Bay in Lake Minnetonka. St. Albans Bay is, um, has very limited connectivity to the rest of Lake Minnetonka. There is like a, an underpass channel to the rest of the lake. Um, obviously it is part of the larger lake, but the, the passage is probably only about 20 feet wide maybe. Um, and so it's, it's, I guess it's more isolated from the rest of the lake than many bays are. Our control bay, on the other hand, was a relatively open bay that had a lot of connectivity. So it, I don't know, Diane, if you have anything to add to that, but the, I guess the geography of the bay was pretty convenient for this type of application. Yeah, I think there's challenges with treating any, any kind of water that has significant flow in order to maintain the concentration. So I don't think that's necessarily specific to, to copper, but it's something that we'd have, you know, you have to address with any treatment. So obviously this is more geared towards uh, lake, reservoir, quarry type environment. Um, and could you explain more about uh, the mode of action that copper has and how, how it's impacting zebra mussels? I'm going to let the PhD student handle that one. <laughs> um, so copper, oh gosh, I, I should have my notes in front of me for this. Um, copper is... Uh, uh, a cell toxicant and uh, um, on some aquatic organisms like fish and different invertebrates, it will bind to receptors on the gills and um, that's how they, that's how those organisms have, um, I guess their negative impacts or their, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, their exposure to copper, um, and I don't know, I feel like I should be able to, to give you more information than this, but that's kind of my, my initial response. 
it's a, it's a general cell toxic and, and um, in many organisms, it's outtaken at the gills. Thank you. Um, and so, so kind of along those lines, there's a couple of questions um, regarding the difference that you saw in mortality between um, the zebra mussels and the native mussels, as well as the um, copper uptake of the zebra mussels uh, compared to native mussels. And I was wondering if you could um, expand on that a little more or, see, or if you had any thoughts behind it. Sorry, Megan, could you say that again? Yeah, yep. So there there were two comments um, or questions um, wondering about the difference that you saw between both mortality compare comparing zebra mussels to the native mussels, as well as the copper uptake um, between zebra mussels and native mussels. And if you had thoughts on um, why that might be. So I'll just mention that I think we have found for um, a number of toxicants that zebra mussels are, can be more sensitive than native mussels. And of course it depends on the life stage. And just because they have a higher filtration rate, it's I think expected that their concentration of copper in the tissues is gonna be greater than it is in native mussels. Thank you. Um, and did, are there any impacts to human recreation uh, following the treatment um, or limits on, on when the water can be used again or how it can be used? No, there are no restrictions. And um, do you know if there's information about if the copper can uh, result in a buildup of copper concentrations in sediments um, and what the consequences of that might be if so? Ultimately, the copper will um, end up in the sediments. And uh, there can be, there, I think there can be some impacts. In general, it's considered non-bioavailable um, after a certain point. But there have been, I think there have been studies I've seen that have both found and not found impacts. Um, okay, Th thank you. I, uh, I, oh, sorry. I'm sorry, Go Megan. Ahead. I was just going to add that that actually will be um, a, a focus, I mean, part of what we'll be looking at in the next study going forward. Um, is looking at background levels of copper in a lake and where this copper might be ending up, particularly in the sediment and some of the native organisms. Great, thank you. Um, and is there uh, any information available or do either of you know if uh, the copper can have impacts to infrastructure, for example, like um, dam systems or watercraft, uh, if there's more long-term exposure? That's a good question. Um, I, I don't know, um, maybe Diane, you have a different answer. I don't think I've heard of anything like that. Um, People, I mean, right now, different copper products are frequently in use. A lot of lakes use them to control algae um, or for swimmer's itch. And so there's already a lot of copper that's being put into our waterways. Um, I mean, a lot of marine or lake paints that are used like on docks or boats sometimes still have copper in them. I haven't heard of any infrastructure issues. Yeah, have you, Diana? There's, I was just thinking there's a lot of copper coatings um, mm -hmm. that are used. So I, I can't answer that. And that's a question that we could um, leave for a written response to look into, Megan. Okay, great, thanks. Yeah, and I, I forgot to mention that to um, all the viewers, but um, I, there, there's a strong chance that we'll have more questions here than we'll have time to ask during the live Q&A. Um, so if we don't get to your question, um, don't worry because Angelique and Diane 
um, have, were nice enough to offer to provide written responses to the remaining questions. So we'll preserve all those questions. Um, as, and as soon as they have the answers available, we'll make that available to everyone. Um, OK, so I'll, I'll scroll on down to my next um, question, which was um, someone was wondering how um, water temperatures or um, perhaps other water quality um, factors might influence the efficacy of earth tech or copper products against um, zebra mussels. Like, can it, so can it work, especially, I think temperature is the main um, question here, but depending on the season in particular. Yeah, so Jim Loma has a paper published in which he looked at temperature dependent toxicity of several different molluscicides and earth tech was one of them. And yeah, there is a, as there is with a lot of them, there is a um, greater sensitivity or the efficacy is, is greater uh, at warmer temperatures. Okay. Um, and you had a couple of slides that had showed um, decreases in concentrations of chlorophyll, um, as well as in the benthic um, invertebrate community. Uh, did you happen to capture how long that trend persisted or, um, or if, if those communities were able to rebound after a period of time? Oh, we, we did not capture um, the change in benthic community and zooplankton communities after that two week period in this treatment. But we are resampling uh, those uh, communities this summer. And going forward, uh, we will be looking at that for more frequent sampling following the treatment. So not just 14 days, but continuing to follow those communities by sampling them uh, <clears throat> into the fall after treatment. Great. Um, and before uh, you held this project, what, what kind of communication um, did you use or outreach to homeowners um, around uh, the lake or the bay where this treatment was happening to let them know about um, the research and, and, and the products that were going into the lake? We held a public meeting, um, I think it was the spring before the treatment, and uh, and Jim was the one that presented at that, and I guess I was in attendance. I think there was also a mailing that went out. Um, I don't know, maybe Diane, I don't know if you recall that. I, I believe there was a mailing that went out, and then um, we did have some press coverage around it too, if, you know, so people hadn't either gotten the mailing or gone to the meeting, they also would have heard about it that way. Great. Um, and I see a few questions um, about what um, your thoughts might be on, on the future for this type of treatment. Like if there, would it, would it be something that would need to happen on, for example, an annual basis, could this eventually become um, something that has uh, stronger levels of control? Um, and also questions about um, if this could work on well-established populations of mussels. Yeah, so I'll, I'll maybe start and say we are looking at this um, as a means of controlling established populations. So that is specific, like that's what we're targeting. Um, are not, it's not early detection. It's those, so Minnetonka has had zebra mussels since I believe 2010. Um, so they're, you know, very present in the lake, especially in those bays that we work with. Um, and as for like frequency, um, I think it would be really interesting to see what the, how the population changes and responds in St. Albans Bay, both when we get, as we start getting the data in from this summer and then from next summer from Minnetonka. Um, that'll give us some insight into how long it's effective for. And um, it'll also be important to 
find out more about what those non-target impacts are so that we can balance the use of the treatment versus some of those repercussions associated with it. Um, yeah, and I think if it's, um, because we're targeting the, the Velliger stage, um, I mean, it'd be nice to get some data back suggesting there, there is an impact in following years, but then potentially it could be something that would be used semi-frequently. I don't know, Diane, if you have any additions to that. Yeah, I, 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 I would agree with, with what you're saying. And I, you know, that is kind of our goal is to be able to see how effective this treatment is for how long, what are the, the net, what's the net return on it if we can uh, reduce zebra muscle recruitment, how long that suppression will last and how will the native communities respond by having more phytoplankton, for instance, for other grazers instead of zebra mussels eating it all. And, and you know, hopefully find that you don't have to repeat those treatments on an annual basis, but maybe um, target them to when zebra mussel populations or some other indicator that their populations are having um, negative impacts on other resident communities in a water body and then targeting the treatments for those time periods or in some cases it's targeting for you know a specific area um, high value area of a a water body. Great. Um, and I see a couple questions wondering about if you see other um, applications for this type of work, for example, in controlling things like mystery snails um, or the snails that tend to be the host for the parasites causing swimmer's itch. Well, I think, you know, copper is a mollusca side, so it's just a matter of finding out. Um, what those lethal concentrations are. I'm, I'm pretty confident it would kill those snails at some concentration. Sure. Um, and there are a number of people who are wondering um, about the cost of a treatment like this. So I would ask to put that down as one of our uh, written responses so I <laughs> I have uh, firm numbers on that. Sure. Um, all right. Oops, I'm sorry, I lost my spot in the in the question list. Yeah, and maybe I'll I'll throw out just as a thing to think about. Um, our costs aren't necessarily what a lake association would pay um, because we we had like our our time and our equipment all wrapped into that and so if someone were doing this commercially it would look a little different so we can probably give you maybe an estimate but it might not be translatable great um and do you do you know um that Sorry, it's, were the, the, I have one more question about the non-target or potential non-target impacts. Um, and that was if you also looked at um, the aquatic vegetation and if there were impacts to the vegetation during the treatment. There was no component to look at aquatic vegetation, but it was certain, it, it is uh, definitely something to consider moving forward. Okay, and then um, I have one more question I think we'll have time for. Um, the Ligon model was discussed and the parameters were reported um, as collected from the Minnetonka treatment. Um, so how does this model compare to the levels of copper used in the treatment um, or in comparison to um, what the literature has for uh, levels and non-targets? 
Okay, I'm going to ask you to repeat that question. Again. Sure, I'll, I'll make sure that I'm answering the right thing. Yep. Um, so this is this was referring back to the ligand model that you had. Um, Mm -hmm. And the question was, so how does this model compare to the levels of copper that were used in the treatment or in comparison to what um, literature might suggest uh, for levels in non-target organisms? Okay, so I have done a little bit of playing around with our Minnetonka work. Uh, so we know how much copper we added and we know what the effect is. I did a little bit of looking through the literature for, um, it, maybe Megan, this could be one that we respond to in writing to to give a more thorough answer since I don't have the numbers in front of me. But I did a little bit of going through the literature and finding, um, I found some information for zebra mussel adults and more limited information for villagers with LT50 values that had corresponding water chemistry and quality metrics. A lot of the data that's out there has some gaps that make it um, make it less friendly for putting through this model. So I used what I was able to find and put it through. And um, I think it corresponds fairly well with what we saw. It does suggest that perhaps we could have even gone slightly lower with our copper concentration, um, which I think potentially our results also might suggest. I mean, we were targeting villagers and we saw reduced villager survival and um, adult mortality. So, um, so I think they're in agreement on that. There is definitely a little more refining that I need to do. Um, but we have gone back and done that comparison, and I can include a little more information in the written answers. Great. Um, and I think this will be the last one. Um, and so there's a question about, as you do your planning for next year, um, wondering if some of the, the work might be used that could target a treatment strategy that would um, reduce the impact of the native fresh water mussels while still maintaining control on the invasive mussels. So I, I'm going to respond to that because I also see some other questions about um, assessing impacts to other uh, non-natives like zooplankton and some of the macroinvertebrates. So one of the things that we'll be doing in the next phase of this is conducting some lakeside toxicity trials. So in in our mobile laboratory. So the plan is that we will be able to look at some of those other non-targets um, within those, uh, within a more controlled situation. And this is where the biotic ligand model is gonna be used to kind of estimate what a, a lethal concentration will be for villagers. But in the toxicity trials will We'll bracket that um, with lower and higher concentrations. So we'll have, you know, a range in there and hopefully be able to see then um, at a, a concentration that will kill villagers, how much mortality we actually have of some of those non-targets. And that will include native mussels. So before we do another lake treatment, we're going to have a, a sense of how much uh, non-target mortality might occur and what species are most sensitive. So a long answer, sorry. Oh, that's perfect. Thanks so much, Diane. Um, and I think that's the last question we'll have time for today. So I did mention that um, Angelique and Diane um, have offered to answer any unanswered questions um, or any that they, they said they'd come back with a little bit more information. Um, in a written format. So we will send that document out to everyone who has registered for today's webinar. Um, I'll switch the screen here. Um, I had mentioned that we had recorded the webinar. It usually takes about a week for us to get through closed captioning and then it will be available on our YouTube channel. Um, you can find our channel and subscribe if you want to get notifications when that video or others go up. 
Um, that's at z.umn.edu slash AIS tube. Um, and if you have any questions for our presenters, uh, both of their emails are currently showing on the screen. Um, so you can reach out to them there. Uh, and if you have questions for us as the webinar host, our email is also um, showing. So questions about future webinars, um, our program or other things, um, educational opportunities that we have, um, we can answer those for you at that email, aisdetectors at umn.edu. Um, and that brings us right to two o'clock. So I'll give a final thank you to Angelique and Diane um, for taking the time to share all your work with us today and um, hope to see the rest of you on a future webinar. Thanks very much. <laughs>